Welcome in Braves Today, bravestoday.com. He is Lindsey Crosby. I am Ben Taylor. You can find us at Braves underscore today on Twitter. And how semi-sweep it is. I'm not going to say sweep yet, even though uh, we got that two out of three that we were talking about minimum. So we shall see if Atlanta is able to pick it up. September 11th, they'll be playing a doubleheader. So uh, everybody will ring a bell on that. The note on that, it feels like a bad idea to have – a game, two games involving Nick Castellanos on September 11th because he just has a way of of doing. I predict right now in June he's going to hit two home runs that day. Oh well, thanks for that, Lindsay. That's that's what we're looking at. So uh, at least they get their two <laughs> wins uh, on the road too. I mean, at yeah. Philly, that's always a good thing because I was a little worried about it, and the reason being is because, and we'll get to Cincy here in a little bit, but they're headed in to face that red hot Cincy team. So I was hoping they could get as many wins as possible just because we will talk about that win streak and what they've been doing as of late. But now 15 of 17 for the Braves. So they're not doing too bad either. Yeah, they and it's it's happened a lot of different ways, right? They go and they bludgeon Colorado with 40 runs over a series. The second game against Philly, it's a pitching duel. You keep them off the board until the 10th inning. Uh, you go and you score five. They get one run and you beat them. So it's, it's a lot of different ways. You're getting great contributions from the pitching. Spencer Strider looked like the old Spencer Strider again, which mm-hmm. was great. He's been, knock on wood, incredibly dominant against the Phillies in a way that he really hasn't against anybody else. He's owned Philadelphia like Chipper Jones owned the Mets. And Hmm. it's always fun when you can do that against a team in your division. So they're doing it lots of different ways, but the point is they're doing it. You love to see it. Hopefully we can keep it going against Cincinnati. One thing that I like to see that the Braves were able to do is take advantage of extra outs, the the air by Schwarber. Now, granted, there were already two guys on, but still – Giving the Braves extra outs, that is something that in the past, in the last couple of seasons, they may not take advantage of. They could sometimes if you had an Acuna up there, if you had, uh, you know, even even day back to the Freddie days, maybe he may take advantage of it and have a solo shot or something of that nature. Putting five runs on the board in the 10th, it was huge to me. And, and, and in, the, in the retrospect of the fact that Philly made a mistake and they made them pay for that mistake. And that's something that's not been very Braves-like in the past. But for some reason this year, they seem to be doing a lot more of that. Yeah, if you don't, like if you score two runs there, only two runs, it's a different bottom of the inning. And Mm. if you don't score at all, you probably lose that game. It's just home teams obviously have the advantage, especially with the, the, the extra runner on second, the Manfred man, if you will. And so being able to capitalize on that and putting up five, Should have been unearned runs. I believe they somehow scored that a hit, and it should have been an error because it hit his glove and he dropped it. But uh, being able to capitalize on that, that was the big deal, getting the crooked number. And that's kind of characteristic for Atlanta. Whoever gets the biggest inning is going to win the game. For the most part, Atlanta got the biggest inning. Atlanta wins the game. So you love to see them capitalizing. You mentioned the Manfred man. This is not on the rundown, but I got to ask you. You a fan, not a fan? How do you feel about that? I'm like you. I do think the home team has an advantage, but I compare it a lot to – let's just say overtime in college football, where if you can stop the team on defense first, it's all up to you. You basically kick a field goal to win the ball game. Yeah, it's, I, it does its job. It shortens the game. I, part of me wants it to be, like in, in, in college, they do something where I think it's after the third overtime, it's just in essence two point, battling two-point yes. conversions. And to me, I kind of feel like maybe you should just keep playing regular baseball for a few innings before you bring this in. But at the same time, I understand the whole idea of, especially in a scoreless game, well, they've not scored over nine innings. Let's get somebody to start scoring. Hmm. It's just one of those things to me where usually when you have a game that's scoreless after nine, it's because the starting pitchers went really long and they were really good. Now that you're in the bullpens, the odds of scoring go up. So maybe give them an inning or two to play normal baseball before you start doing things like the Manfred man. But it does shorten the games. You don't see a ton of incredibly long. And now it's noteworthy when you see a 12-inning game. You're like, how did that happen? Mm. You know, it's because both teams scored maybe twice in a row, and that's how you get, you get to extras. So it's more memorable, but it's it does weird things to the stats because they're unearned runs and all of this, and you don't have to get a base hit, and you can win. You get two mm. sack flies, you're done. So it's kind of weird. I'm I'm pro, and the only reason I'm pro is because there's 162 games. Yeah. So I think it's for, from a player standpoint, I like it. I'm I'm like you from a baseball purist standpoint. 
I think you have the best solution. I do think that maybe they let them go after 11 innings, then they start putting a runner on. Let them go two extra innings, see what they can work out. But uh, there is no perfect answer. Who knows? They seem to like it. The players seem to have adjusted well at first. They did not like it, but now the rest of them seem to think that it's okay. I think it's what you get used to. Acuna, he will steal on you. People need to realize that. And not just that, even his quote-unquote sneaky steal, where if you're not paying attention, he will take the next base. He's done that about three times now, I think, mm. this season. Three or four. And, I mean, if you haven't seen him do it, if you're watching this and you haven't seen him do it, in essence, usually he's on second. And he'll just he'll start getting a walking lead. And if he notices the third baseman's playing back, he notices the pitcher's not looking, he'll just run and take third. And he's like I said, he's done it three or four times now. And there's never a throw. It's just, it's heads-up baseball from Ronald. It's not heads-up baseball from the opponents. But it's something where... Like, it, it just proves the thing we keep saying about this lineup is you can never take a break. Uh, you start off the game, Ronald Acuna Jr. is your first batter, and then if he's ever on base, you have to be paying, you have to be locked in every single pitch and between every single pitch, and most teams can't do that. Time to keep respecting our elder as he continues to have what Snit said after the game, all-star year thus far, and should be on the ballot. Yeah, I mean, it's that was one of the best starts of the year for him, obviously, from a statistical standpoint. He had two kind of rough starts, and then this happens. And I've been kind of digging into, I've been trying to dig in and find uh, exactly what it is he's doing because uh, the stuff doesn't necessarily look that amazingly overwhelming, but it's working. Guys really aren't doing stuff to him. And be looking this weekend on bravestoday.com. I'm going to have something digging into. I've, Found some stuff about maybe it's it's his release height, maybe it's you know the the pitch mix, this and that. So we're gonna dive into it. But suffice to say, like this is real. This is not a fluke. It you have, the sample size is big enough where no Bryce Elder was just a really really good pitcher, mm -hmm. and we didn't realize it until now. And so, like you said, it is a this is an all star caliber season he's having, and the Braves pitching development continues to just churn out guys Kyle Wright comes out of essentially nowhere last year to lead the league in mm -hmm. wins and now Bryce Elder for the longest time had the lowest ERA in baseball still one of the best uh best ERAs and is deserving of an all-star spot so Atlanta just keeps finding guys keeps producing aces and you love to see it speaking of the battery uh let's talk about the catching position a little bit as uh Murphy was able to come in and pinch hit uh, he ended up striking out, but it seems like that may be his role, at least for the next series. Uh, but it seems that he may have bounced back from that hamstring injury. They just don't want to get to where he's having to get up and down and up and down out of the squat position at the catcher spot. Yeah, it's and that's the real issue when it comes to a hamstring with a catcher, because most guys, it's running. That's the concern you have. But with the catcher, so much up and down, obviously, it's the force on your knees but it's also the torque on that hamstring when you're trying to block. It's the it's the quick, rapid movements with the legs. Uh, if he's feeling really good, you may see something on Sunday since that is a day game. You may see where they decide to let him catch on Sunday if he's doing better than they expect. But Snitker said the plan is he's going to be a pinch hit option late, and we're going to just let Travis keep starting. That's the luxury you have on this team is you have two really good catchers. Travis was an all-star last year at catcher, and he's your backup this year. So... Uh, you're in a great place. Most teams would be starting uh, a really bad offensive hitter that is just there to play defense. They'd be starting this guy for a week, and instead Atlanta has an all-star from last year to take a week of starts. Speaking of Travis, and uh, Derno was called out, pitch clock violation, not being in the box. I, a couple of takeaways from this from my end. I think it was a Bush League call. Uh, he was in the box. He wasn't necessarily looking at the pitcher, but the pitcher also was. Kimbrell was not ready, uh, but Darno was in the box and standing there. No part of his body was out of the box by the eight-second mark. As a matter of fact, I think that the umpire jumped the gun a little bit. It looked like he came out from behind the plate between second nine and second eight as it was ticking down to make the call. It was almost like he made it all about himself. And the most shocking part to me Lindsay, is he's doing that against a guy that's about to come back out of the dugout and sit in front of him. And so usually catchers get the benefit of the doubt on calls, on balls and strikes, because there's a relationship there. Yeah. And I honestly was curious, once Murphy pitch hit, I thought, I wonder if Darno's going to go out and get tossed on purpose. 
But now that I've figured out that Murphy's not able to squat, that's probably why he kept his mouth shut. Yeah, and it's there was a, a big series of stories earlier this year about some of the pitch clock inconsistencies in Philadelphia and how MLB addressed, uh, you know, specifically addressed the pitch clock and everything got a lot tighter. And even Philly's players comment it feels like they have less time compared to like at the home compared to on the road. And so there's something weird going on with the clock, but my whole rule on it, it shouldn't matter where the batter is looking. If you are in the box, they can pitch you. And so there's been, I remember we, we, the, the very first violation of the entire year in spring training was a Braves hitter who was yes. in the box, but not looking. The catcher was standing up because he had not gotten in his squat yet, and the Braves hitter was called out because it, that was the that was the third strike. And so, if you're in the box, it shouldn't matter if you're looking or not. If you're in the box, you're eligible to get a pitch thrown to you. That should be all that matters. Wasn't that Arcia in the in the? Uh... It was a prospect. I want to say it was Cal oh, was Conley. It? Yeah, it was a pro- okay. It was a prospect. I, that, yeah, that was the one that blew everybody's mind because they were like, "All right, this is the first time it's happened." And now, you and see- it decided the game because there was it two did. outs. The game was tied, and spring training is going to end in the tie. And so Atlanta had, I think, two runners on. Uh, it was a two-two count. The strike called on him was strike three. Uh, so that was the third out. And so the game just ended in a tie because of the pitch clock. And that was the first time when people started really writing the pieces about what's going to happen in the regular season when a game gets decided by the pitch clock. I will agree with the Phillies. He got called on Darno for a strikeout. That's another reason I'm, I'm shocked that they made the call. Mm-hmm. Uh, it got called on Bryce Harper, and it also got called on Craig Kimbrell. So we saw three of those violations in one game, and I just was shocked. I was like, what is going on here? So It's a, it's a very fast clock in Philly. It, apparently it is. And, and either that or maybe they're warning umpires saying, hey, when you're in Philadelphia, all eyes are on you. You're in a big market. We got to make sure people know what we're doing. Speaking mm-hmm. of Philly, final takeaways from that series uh, success. I, I, I put in the notes to you. It revolved around everything. Bats, pitching, everything just seemed to be clicking for the Braves in Philly. And it, it's coming at the perfect time, too, because this is something where we had talked <laughs> about you had a stretch of 16 games against teams with losing records. And then. Uh, obviously Philly's doing better and then you have a red hot Cincinnati team. So Atlanta needed those complete games where they showed everything was working. The bullpen was working. uh, The the starting rotation was working and the bats were working because you're rolling into a, a a juggernaut, a wagon in the Cincinnati Reds. Has uh, Minter figured it out? He looked really good. AJ Minter, I think has figured it out. So since he blew that save late May against Philly, since then, he did a little bit of lower leverage stuff. He did like a sixth inning, a seventh inning, a couple seventh innings. Mm-hmm. Since then, 11 and two-thirds innings, two hits, one run. That one run was a solo shot in a three-run game. Uh, one walk to 14 strikeouts. I think he's figured it out. And I honestly just, I think it was a little bit of overuse. When you kind of look at earlier in the year, he had a lot of four-inning outings, five, I'm sorry, uh, four-out outings, mm-hmm. five-out outings, Everything since then has been one inning. It's most of them have been under 15 pitches. And I think that was the big difference is trying to not necessarily use him for, for more than an inning, just three, three outs. Once he gets above 20 pitches, we'll start getting the next guy ready. Well, that was one thing too. You mentioned it. The watermark seems to be 20, 15 to 20 gets kind of scary. Once he goes over 20, that seems to go down the wrong road. However, he's going to be need to be on his game, Acuna on his game, all the pitching staff on their game, because this is a red-hot Cincinnati team that Atlanta is about to face. And, I mean, 11 straight, and, you know, Atlanta's hot on their own, and they've, you know, but this team has won 13 of their last 15, and they seem to be on fire. Yeah, this is it's a fantastic stat that we found. Uh, if, the like, this matchup between Atlanta and Cincinnati, this is the fifth time in the last 122 years wow. that you've had two teams with an eight or more game active win streak facing each other. And one of those times was Atlanta in 2021. Mm-hmm. Atlanta took a nine game win streak. Uh, well, they, they, they were at home against the Yankees who were both on nine game win streaks. And I believe Atlanta won that game. And so like I said, fifth time this has happened in 122 years. Going to be a fantastic matchup this weekend. Very excited to see, specifically on Friday night, what happens when you have the unstoppable force and the immovable object. 
Yeah, it's uh, Atlanta's already made their pitching announcements. Uh, Cincinnati seems to be wavering on who they're going to pitch in game two, but we'll get to see the old man Morton before the weekend's over with. Uh, Schuster, who got not bumped, but just moved uh, from this uh, last series. So that uh, is going to put him in this series to pitch game two. And, and Smith Schauber is going to kick things off for the Braves on Friday night. Yeah, and it's one of those things where Atlanta's finding opportunities where they can here and there to kind of build a little bit of rest in for some guys. You know, Schuster kind of getting moved a little bit. Schmidt Schauver was supposed to be that game that got rained out in Philly. And so rather than than uh, pushing Elder back, they kept Elder on regular rest and they mm-hmm. pushed the rookie back to Friday, get him a little couple extra days. And so AJ Schmidt Schauver on Friday, 640 Eastern, standard broadcast, Valley Sports Southeast. You've got an afternoon game on Saturday with Jared Schuster, 410, again, Bally Sports Southeast. And then Sunday is your usual afternoon game, 140 Eastern, uh, with Charlie Morton versus righty Ben Lively. So we know it's Luke Weaver on Friday. We know it's Ben Lively on Sunday. We don't quite know who it's going to be on Saturday yet. But um, either way, it doesn't matter because you got two righties, Atlanta's been hit, their righty hitting guys have been doing pretty well. Eddie Rosario's hot. Michael Harris is hot. And if you start a lefty on Saturday, this lineup is constructed to destroy lefties. So either way, I feel good about Atlanta's chances, especially in this tiny ballpark. I got Atlanta two of three and ending the win streak that Cincinnati has got going. And, uh, it, but it's not due to the, the fact that Cincinnati had been playing uh, reputable opponents. It just I think that, as you just said, uh, they're going to be. It, you're going to have a, a, a immobile or immobile object, you know, coming up against an unbelievable force. So something's got to give. Atlanta seems this year to be able to step up and play teams like this, like they did Arizona whenever they were out there. You know, it's the it's the Oakland A's of the world that always bother me with Atlanta. It's never the guys like when they take on the Mets or when they take on the Marlins or when they take on the Cincinnati Reds. They seem to have that locker room that goes or clubhouse that goes. All right, we know what we have to do. It's all business. Let's go out here and get our job done. When Atlanta gets a first place team, they seem to do pretty well. And if you look at who the car, at who the the Reds beat in their their win streak, the Cardinals they they won for two games against the Cardinals, one of the worst teams in the National League. The Royals, one of the worst teams in mm. baseball. The Astros, who have really really struggled this year and are not very good, and the Rockies, one of the worst teams in baseball. <laughs> I'm going to go on a limb. And I'm going to say the Braves sweep Cincinnati in Cincinnati this weekend. I just think the Braves' offense is too good. That ballpark is conducive to runs. And you've got either pitchers with stuff that's hard to hit, like at A.J. Smith-Shaver, or you've got veterans who can hang out and give you length, like a Charlie Morton. So I'm going bold, and I'm calling a sweep of Cincinnati by Atlanta. He's Lindsey Crosby. I'm Ben Taylor. Braves today. Braves underscore today on the Twitter and bravestoday.com. Lindsey, as always, thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Chop on.